que o petróleo um dia vai acabar, todos concordam. Sobre quando isso vai acontecer, muitos discordam. Agora, o que todos admitem é que as últimas reservas estão concentradas no Oriente Médio e é dessa região conflituosa que o mundo vai depender cada vez mais para ter combustível. Diante dos novos tempos difíceis, a discussão em torno das energias alternativas ganha mais atenção. E este é o tema do Roda Viva desta noite. Nosso convidado é o economista americano Jeremy Rifkin. Ele é hoje um dos principais críticos do predomínio do petróleo como combustível e prevê que o hidrogênio poderá promover uma revolução na, na economia, como aconteceu com o carvão e o vapor no começo da era industrial. Jeremy Rifkin, com formação em economia e assuntos internacionais, mora em Washington e é consultor de empresários e congressistas americanos. Ele é um estudioso dos impactos que as tecnologias promovem na economia e na sociedade e já escreveu vários livros a respeito. O último deles acaba de ser lançado aqui no Brasil e fala que o mais básico e onipresente dos elementos do universo pode ser o combustível do futuro. E mais do que isso, o combustível eterno. A economia do hidrogênio, quando não houver mais petróleo. Jeremy Rifting começa dizendo que a crise energética dos anos 70 foi esquecida e o debate sobre conservação de energia tornou-se cada vez mais raro. No entanto, o mundo caminha para um ponto crítico na era dos combustíveis fósseis. Especialistas acham que ainda temos cerca de 40 anos de petróleo bruto, disponível e barato. Mas existem geólogos alertando que a produção de petróleo pode atingir um pico e entrar em queda já no final desta década. A vulnerabilidade que isso cria para a vida industrial é agravada por dificuldades novas que surgiram no mundo, afetando não só a economia, mas a democracia e a divisão de poder na Terra. É nesse horizonte que o autor projeta uma nova era energética, com base no hidrogênio, o elemento mais abundante do universo, encontrado principalmente na água. Mas é do gás natural, em processos modernos e de mais baixo custo, que atualmente ele está sendo retirado e disponibilizado para uso como combustível. O hidrogênio, já usado em naves espaciais, vem sendo testado em protótipos da indústria automobilística. Usado como fonte das células combustíveis, ele pode representar uma nova forma de produção de energia elétrica, descentralizada e democrática. Para Jeremy Hifting, o hidrogênio pode acabar com a dependência do petróleo, reduzir a emissão de carbono na atmosfera e apaziguar guerras políticas e religiosas. Para entrevistar o economista e consultor Jeremy Rifkin, nós convidamos Eugênio Esber, diretor de redação da revista Amanhã Economia e Negócios e da revista Aplauso. Hélio Gurovitz, diretor do portal Exame, da revista Exame. Mônica Teixeira, editora de Ciência e Tecnologia da TV Cultura. Maurício Tufani, editor-chefe da revista Galileu. Márcio Pockman, economista e secretário do Trabalho da Prefeitura de São Paulo. E Ari Plonski, diretor-superintendente do IPT, Instituto de Pesquisas Tecnológicas de São Paulo. O Roda Viva é transmitido em rede nacional para todos os estados brasileiros e também para Brasília. Hoje, infelizmente, o programa não permite a participação do telespectador, porque está sendo gravado. Boa noite. Eu queria começar com uma provocação. É, ontem eu estava cozinhando uh, numa casa de campo, num fogão a lenha. Hoje de manhã eu tomei banho num chuveiro movido a energia elétrica. Vim para cá num carro movido a gasolina. E o senhor disse que daqui a 30 anos nós vamos estar consumindo hidrogênio. Não é um pouco de otimismo demais? Well, I don't think so. I, I think we're on the cusp of one of the great energy revolutions in history. We're moving out of the fossil fuel era, a 200-year history that began with carrying coal to Newcastle in England, and now that history is winding down in those oil fields in the Middle East. There are over a thousand companies racing to the hydrogen future. There are several thousand startup companies. PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study projecting that by 2020, this industry will be worth $1.7 trillion. That's in 17 years from now. I think that the public, and to some extent our politicians uh, and economists, are way behind where this technology is moving. It's a little reminiscent of the internet, a software and computer and telecom revolution in the 1980s. It caught the politicians by surprise, it caught the public by surprise, caught the economists by surprise, but anyone who was in the field knew that the door was opening. 
So we're on the verge of a great hydrogen revolution. We're in the early years. It's going to take 10, 20, 30, 40 years to lay down the infrastructure. That's how long it took to lay down the steam, coal, and rail infrastructure in the 19th century. And that's how long it took to lay down the automobile internal combustion engine road structure of the 20th century. Agora, no caso, o senhor menciona a internet. A internet, de alguma maneira, ela, digamos, avançou sobre um espaço vazio. Quer dizer, ela surgiu e se estabeleceu como algo que não existia. Quando a gente fala em o combustível, em toda a estrutura da economia que é baseada no combustível, combustível fóssil, basicamente no petróleo e seus derivados, nós estamos falando de algo que já está estabelecido e que certamente terá que ser desmontado para que um novo sistema de combustível é, predomine. Isso não é um muito mais difícil e muito mais demorado do que, por exemplo, o crescimento que a internet revelou? Well, it's going to be one of the great disruptive revolutions in history, but that was the case when we introduced steam, coal and rail. It changed everything. It not only changed the way we conduct economic activity, it changed our time frames, our spatial organization. It changed our notion of politics and society. Remember, when we went from a wood-burning culture to steam and coal and rail, we also went from small local markets to national markets. We went from city-state to nation-state. We went from feudal economy to capitalist economy. All of this is a result of an energy revolution. The second industrial revolution with oil and the internal combustion engine uh, moved us into suburban ways of life, dispersing populations, great urban cities developed. So yes, this hydrogen revolution will be disruptive of the existing infrastructure. Uh, but that's always been the case with a great energy change. But you mentioned something else that I, I think is important. You mentioned the internet. I'd like to spend a second to talk about how the communication revolution fits into the energy revolution. The great economic revolutions in history, the really great ones, they occur when two things happen. First, a basic change in the way human beings organize the energy of the earth. And then second, a great change in the way we communicate with each other to organize the new energy regime. When new energy and new communications converge, they are the pivotal points in history. Example, ancient Iraq, Sumeria, first great agricultural civilization. The increased complexity of organizing agriculture was quite different for human beings. We took the sun's energy, stored it in cereal plants, the surplus grain became the energy for civilization. But this complexity of organizing agriculture required a new command and control mechanism called cuneiform writing. Writing was the way to manage agriculture. The print press became absolutely essential to the steam, coal, and rail revolution. Because as we moved to steam and coal, we increased the pace, the speed, the flow, the complexity of human exchange. We needed a new communication between people to organize it, print press. The telephone and telegraph preceded by a few years the internal combustion engine and oil. Here's my point. We had a great communication revolution in the 1990s. Digital technologies, personal computers, the World Wide Web, the telecom revolution. But we really didn't understand its true mission in history. We, in, we did uh, connect the central nervous system of a billion people with the web, the World Wide Web. And that was uh, significant. We increased productivity at the workplace with the new communications. Significant. But all of those dot-com companies, they were completely silly. We didn't know what to do with this communication revolution, so we created these silly little companies, and most of them went out of business. My point is this. In the next six months, the next year, the investment community, the business community, is going to become aware of a great convergence. The convergence between the communication and software revolution of the 1990s and the new distributive decentralized hydrogen revolution of the first two decades of the 21st century. When we go to hydrogen, it means you get a fuel cell. And the fuel cell is analogous to a personal computer. So you have a fuel cell in your industrial park, your commercial shopping center, and your home. You generate your own electricity, just like you generate your own content with a personal computer. The surplus electricity that you don't need, you send it back to the power grid. But here's where the revolution is. The Hewlett Packards and the Microsofts of the world, their real mission, they're going to use that communication revolution 
to decentralize every power grid in Brazil. So that when you generate electricity with your fuel cell from your home, factory, or office, you'll be able to send that electricity peer to peer, like information, to whoever you designate on the grid, just like you do with a computer. The coming together of decentralized communication as the command and control mechanism to organize decentralized distributive energy, that's power to the people. That's a great revolution in history. And its impact will be as significant as the coming together of print with coal and steam and rail, the 19th century first industrial revolution. And it'll be as significant in the, as the coming together of the telephone and telegraph with the internal combustion engine and oil. The coming together of hydrogen, fuel cells, and the World Wide Web, decentralized communication. It's the third industrial revolution. It will impact the entire 21st century. Rifkin, eu queria fazer uma pergunta. O senhor faz essa pregação sobre sobre a célula combustível, mas hoje me parece que há pelo menos duas questões tecnológicas a serem resolvidas. Uma delas que para gerar essa energia é necessário nesse momento de alguma maneira quebrar hidrogênio e usar energia. Então gostaria de saber o que, como é que o senhor acha que isso é, vai, vai ser feito no futuro e, e como isso será barateado, porque hoje é, praticamente se gasta mais. E a outra questão é o tamanho dessas células combustíveis, que também me parece, né, do, ou melhor, dos estoques de hidrogênio, que também me parecem que tem que ser grandes, etc. Então, gostaria que o senhor abordasse essas duas questões. Well, you hit a central problem. Let me put it in context. The whole world today revolves around oil. This is an oil civilization. Mm -hmm. We produce our foods with petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. Our clothes are made out of mainly petrochemical <coughs> synthetics. Our pharmaceutical products, our packaging and plastic materials, our power, our heat, our light, it's all oil. The problem is the oil age is going to peak in the next several decades. Mm -hmm. This, uh, now, the scientists disagree as to when. Mm -hmm. Some say as early as the end of this decade, some say as late as 2035, but that's a small time in history. So on the horizon is hydrogen. It's an alternative to fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. The good news about hydrogen is it's the basic element of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff of the stars. It's the lightest element in existence. And when you burn hydrogen, the only byproduct is pure water and heat. Mm -hmm. The astronauts have been actually drinking the byproduct water because mm -hmm. they use fuel cells for 30 years up in space. Now, that's all the good news. The bad news you've pointed out, hydrogen's not free floating. Mm -hmm. You have to extract it from something else. Now, most of the hydrogen commercially today is extracted from fossil fuels, mostly from natural gas. So we steam the hydrogen out of the natural gas, store it, then put it in a fuel cell for power, heat, and light. The problem is natural gas, it emits less CO2 than oil, but the studies, at least that I have in my book, suggest that natural gas is going to peak mm -hmm. in production maybe 10 years after oil. So if we build an entire global infrastructure on trying to take hydrogen out of natural gas or oil or coal, we're still going to be in the fossil fuel mm -hmm. era. There's another way to do this, but it's more expensive and it's more elegant, and it is the future, but we have to bring the cost down. Mm -hmm. And that is to take renewable energy, wind, solar photovoltaic, si. hydro, geothermal and biomass, those are all renewable energies. Generate them locally, then you have electricity. Now si. some of the electricity you use immediately for power, heat, and light. Okay. The surplus that you don't need you immediately use that electricity to electrolyze water, like in high school chemistry class, mm -hmm. separate the hydrogen mm -hmm. from the oxygen in the water, then you have stored hydrogen. Then you have power, just like coal, oil, and gas. It's stored power. Now, it's expensive because you're generating electricity twice. First to get the electricity from renewables, then to electrolyze mm -hmm. the water for the hydrogen mm -hmm. for the power cells. But here's my point. This really needs to be understood, especially here in Brazil, but around the world. This generation has wanted a, a future made out of renewable energy. For 30 years, we've been talking about renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, mm -hmm. hydro. You cannot have a renewable energy society. It's impossible to even have one without hydrogen as the storage carrier. Okay. 
because it, when you're generating electricity, you can't store it in any major way. It flows immediately in the transmission. So if the wind stops blowing for a few days over Brazil, mm -hmm. or the sun isn't shining, or there's not enough water because of drought, your electricity stops. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what happened in Brazil in 2001. Mm -hmm. You had an electricity crisis that became an economic crisis because 92% of all the mm -hmm. electricity you generate in this country is already renewable. It's hydroelectric. Mm -hmm. But the water was not there mm -hmm. and the electricity couldn't be generated. So hydrogen is a secondary carrier. It's not primary energy. You use it to store energy. Now, had Brazil used hydrogen as a storage carrier, mm -hmm. You could have been using your hydroelectric power, some of it sending it down the transmission line. The surplus during good times, you could have used to electrolyze the water right there and had stored energy when the water wasn't flowing. So here's the bell curve. The price for oil and gas is going to continue to go up as we move toward global peak in production over the next 10, 20, or 30 years. There'll be some times it'll go down, but it's edging up, up, up as we reach peak production. Mm -hmm. The indirect cost of oil and gas are going up. The military cost alone for the United States of securing oil in the Middle East was greater than the net value of the oil we were importing before we went to war. Mm -hmm. Add 70 billion for the war, 30, 40 billion a year to stay there, and you begin to see the indirect costs are significant. Mm -hmm. The second indirect cost mm -hmm. for oil and gas is global warming. Mm -hmm. As we burn more fossil fuels, we create more CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, we destabilize the ecosystems of the world, the economic costs are devastating. Droughts, wildfires in the forests, uh, uh, water uh, damage on our coastal regions, species crossing biological boundaries and creating new health effects. It goes on and on and on. So the direct and indirect cost of oil and gas are going to continue to go up as we move toward the end of the fossil fuel era. Now. The cost of renewable technologies and hydrogen fuel cell technologies are going down. Moore's law has set in. You know Moore's law. We first saw this in uh, the software industry, and then we saw it in the biotech industry, where your technology is moving so quick that you're doubling your knowledge in the technology and halving the cost every 18 months. That threshold in technology has now been reached for renewable technologies like wind, solar, hydro and for fuel cells. So the costs are going down. As we adapt these renewable technologies, the costs go down because of economies of scale. And third, fuel cells are two and a half times more efficient than the internal combustion engine. So the cost of oil and gas go up globally over the next 10, 20, 30 years. The cost of uh, renewable technologies and fuel cell technologies go down. As they approach each other, we begin to see a shift from the old energy regime to the new, and I'll finish with this. There's a caveat. This is only going to happen if there's an intelligent public-private partnership. No great energy shift of this magnitude in history occurs in the marketplace alone. Mm -hmm. It requires government and a public consensus to make this happen. Então, nesse momento, existem linhas de pesquisa ou financiamento de linhas de pesquisa que permitam esse barateamento de custos que é necessário. Porque me parece que essa, essa parceria a qual o senhor se refere entre público e privado será também para financiar linhas de pesquisa que permitam o barateamento, é isso? É correto, mas eu deveria também, nós estamos indo para frente, mas eu vou jump right in with you. Há algumas políticas que estão aqui, que todo mundo precisa saber, especialmente com o novo governo aqui. Há uma guerra política 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 and the United States mm -hmm. and how to approach the hydrogen future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I serve as a personal advisor to Romano Prodi, mm -hmm. who is the president of the European Commission, the governing body of the European Union. Last March, I presented President Prodi with a long strategic white paper on how the European Union could create a partnership between government, European industry, and NGOs, the civil society, mm -hmm. to create a roadmap for a step-by-step -step transition out of oil dependency mm -hmm. into becoming the first fully integrated renewable-based hydrogen superpower of the 21st century. I presented that to him. He and I spent personal time on it. He gave the green light. Six months later in October, six months, 
we introduced the plan in last October, a partnership bringing all the major European businesses together in a partnership with the government, 2 billion euros to begin, just begin this process. And when Mr. Prodi made the announcement, he said this will be the next great step for integration for Europe after the euro. First we centralized currency, now we're going to decentralize energy for a new energy grid for Europe. Second, Mr. Prodi said, this will be to Europe what the space program was to the United States. Your space program allowed you the multiplier effect, the high-tech economy of the 1990s. Mm -hmm. We want to use this renewable approach to hydrogen to become the first sustainable technology power of the 21st century. Third, he said, we're comfortable in Europe with public-private partnerships. It was a little provocative statement about the United States. And of course, everyone thought Airbus versus Boeing. Airbus is a public-private partnership. They're now number one in aerospace in airplane manufacturers. So Mr. Prodi was mindful of history. You know, the, the British became the great world power in the 19th century for one reason alone. They were the first to harness their coal reserves mm -hmm. with steam power. Mm -hmm. The United States of America became the great power in the 20th century because it was the first to harness the biggest oil reserves in the world in Texas mm -hmm. with the internal combustion engine which we borrowed from the Germans, Daimler and Benz. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prodi, who's a professor of history, is intent that the new Europe, which will be 25 countries next May, 25 countries, mm -hmm. a constitution in place, 450 million people, a GDP rivaling the United States, Mr. Prodi has determined that Europe becomes the first post-oil power relying on renewable hydrogen energy. And we're holding a hydrogen summit in June to announce the roadmap. I'll be there to keynote it along with Mr. Prodi. Here's why I mention this. President Bush is also into hydrogen because the pressure from Europe came back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And many corporations said, my God, Europe could get ahead of us. This could be like when Russia sent up Sputnik. We don't want to fall behind in the technology race. Mm -hmm. So many US companies put pressure on Mr. Bush. And in his State of the Union address, he said hydrogen is the future. It took the entire American public by surprise. Most Americans went to the dictionary. They thought hydrogen is what you put in balloons for parties for your children. And the old people thought, oh, the Hindenburg. Right, the Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. But there's a very big difference between the U.S. approach to hydrogen and Europe. In Europe, they are committed to a renewable energy future. 22% of all the electricity generated in the European Union has to be renewable in seven years from now. And 12% of all of its energy, as you know, has to be renewable. Mm -hmm. That's the most aggressive target for renewable energy in the world. Mm -hmm. You need hydrogen to store the renewable energy. All right, for all the reasons Brazil mm -hmm. found out with its drought. No renewable water, couldn't, didn't have a storage mm -hmm. capacity. Now, in the United States, President Bush is touting hydrogen as the future, but when you look at the budget that's going to the Congress, where is he putting the money? To find ways to extract hydrogen from coal, mm -hmm. to find ways to extract hydrogen from natural gas and oil, and even to give billions to the nuclear industry to extract hydrogen. So President Bush is using hydrogen as a Trojan horse to bolster the oil interest. He wants to take us into a hydrogen future without leaving the fossil fuel and nuclear past. So there are two broad political, scientific, technological, commercial visions of this public-private partnership. Europe's not opposed to fossil fuels. We know we're going to be using fossil fuels for a long time. But in Europe, there are three tracks. Use fossil fuels carefully. Agree to the Kyoto Protocols. Agree to fuel efficiency standards. Use your oil very, very carefully. Don't waste it. Two, natural gas is a short-term transition. But three, heavy subsidizing of renewables so that by 2020 or 2030, when fossil fuels are really expensive, we have a new infrastructure. By contrast, President Bush is only on track one, mm -hmm. extract hydrogen from fossil fuels. He's never going to get to a renewable hydrogen future that way. Mm -hmm. So for Brazil, with this new government in place, which wants to be a model for the developing world, this is a very, very important political lesson. Mm -hmm. Do we go with the European model for Brazil, or, or do we go with the U.S. model for Brazil? Mm -hmm. Professor, Devemos, de, de, pensamos exatamente que, sendo o Brasil o país que o senhor descreveu, 
Talvez nós possamos ter um pensamento autônomo e não necessariamente copiar nem o modelo americano, nem o modelo europeu. E nesse sentido, das suas palavras, o que me parece relevante são a preocupação com uma matriz energética diversificada e com um processo decisório dinâmico, pelo qual nós possamos acompanhar de maneira muito simpática as uh, visões futuristas e uh, de natureza muito humanitária que o senhor traz, com a velocidade com que as coisas de, se desenvolvem no mundo real. Uh, por exemplo, eu queria lhe perguntar uh, como o senhor vê uh, a evolução numa certa linha mais incremental, uh, green diesel, uh, ultra low emissions e, e outras formas pelas quais a... Uh, preocupação ambiental vem sendo desenvolvida. Os carros de hoje, eles poluem dez vezes menos do que os carros de dez anos atrás. E, possivelmente, há uma questão que em países onde a infraestrutura, é, como o senhor bem colocou, é escassa, é cara, uma mudança radical de infraestrutura deve ser pensada com muita cautela. Nós podemos ter um caminho de evolução incremental enquanto observamos o que acontece de maneira mais radical. Completely agree with you. We need to have mm. several uh, parallel tracks at the same mm. time. Let's take automobiles, because you raised automobiles. Uh, it doesn't do us any good to say we're going to have hydrogen fuel cell cars in 2010, so we do nothing over the next seven years, but to have gas guzzlers. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is put the hybrids out. Mm -hmm. They're workable. Uh, they're cheap. Uh, where you combine uh, natural gas with electricity, um, you combine electricity with mm -hmm. fossil fuels. So the hybrid cars are a short-term transition to get us to a fully renewable hydrogen-based fuel cell car. Now, I think that that's critical. I also believe that we have to use existing fuels very, very carefully. The United States is not doing that. Let me talk to you for a second about the uh, what's going on with the auto industry. The auto industry has spent two billion dollars on fuel cell cars. Now most of us in the environmental movement, most of my colleagues, said this is a trick. This is a trick. They're talking about this great hydrogen future because they don't want to deal with fuel efficiency standards. They don't want to sign the Kyoto Protocols for global warming. So they're tricking us with this far off fantasy. All right? Let me say, and I've been in the environmental movement for this 35 years, it's not a trick. Two billion dollars is not a trick, but It wasn't serious until last year. What turned the tables was the state of California. Last year, as you know, the state of California passed a legislation. If you want to sell an automobile in the state of California in the year 2009, you have to have near zero emissions. That's hydrogen fuel cell cars. Now, General Motors and all the auto companies have sued California. And unfortunately, the White House has joined the lawsuit, but privately, Mr. Wagoner at General Motors, Mr. Ford at the Ford Motor Company, Toyota, Honda, BMW, privately, they're in a furious race to be the first with cheap fuel cell hydrogen cars. The reason? You can't lose California. It's the biggest automobile market in the world. It's the fifth largest economy. Have you seen the General Motors car, the high wire car? The Brazilian public needs to see this car. It is truly a revolutionary concept. It was debuted at the Paris Motor Show last fall mostly designed in Europe by the Italians, the Germans, and the Swedes. This car is all glass. It burns hydrogen. Your only byproduct is pure water and heat. Now, it's fossil fuels right now to get the hydrogen. We would rather have electricity coming from renewables. But this car, you don't buy a car. You buy a power plant. It's a new concept. General Motors sells you four wheels with a skateboard in between. It's a power plant. That's what you buy. Then you snap on whatever car you want. You can snap on a convertible, snap on an SUV, a station wagon. It's modular, all glass. No steering wheel, doesn't exist. No brakes, no pedal, no engine. It's a joystick, all run by wire. It's a dot-com car for the dot-com generation. I'll never be able to figure out how to ride this car, but every Brazilian kid growing up on video games and computers, any 10-year-old could get in this car. What's important about this car is when you're not using it, it's a power plant. So if 25% of the cars in Brazil, when you're not driving, just parking, were plugged back into a decentralized smart power grid, just like the communication power grid, the World Wide Web, you plug in 25% of the Brazilian cars when you're not driving them, 
you can eliminate every power plant in South America. In my country, you can eliminate every power plant in North America. You have to think of a fuel cell, whether it's in a car or a home or an industrial park, as analogous to a personal computer. When they all hook up, they're generating power, just like when all the computers in the world hook up, they're generating content and information at the speed of light. But this time, unlike few past civilizations where power was always centralized, from the great civilizations in Egypt and Sumeria to the oil civilizations of the 20th century, this time, in theory at least, in theory, the power is bottom up because each person could potentially produce their own power. So uh, there's going to be transitions along the way. This is not a, a killer app, app, as we say in business. This is a long-term disruptive revolution with lots of problems. The question is, how do we start on that roadmap so that we can get to the solutions? Mr. Rifkin. Eu queria mudar o assunto e falar de um tema que, com certeza, uma grande parte dos telespectadores, é, para esse público, é muito mais próximo do que a questão do hidrogênio, que é a questão do emprego, outro tema que o senhor abordou é, num livro e que eu tenho certeza que é, a grande maioria da nossa audiência concorda que está havendo uma grave mudança no emprego e dá a impressão de que isso é uma espécie de extinção até, extinção mais próxima do que a dos combustíveis fósseis. É... Do you have any hypothesis optimist in this scenario? Well, I wrote a book a few years ago called The End of Work. Unfortunately, uh, I think the time frame I laid out in that book is, is happening even quicker than I had e expected. Mm -hmm. You know, the industrial age ended slave labor. We had machines that could replace the physical labor of slavery. The information age, this new high-tech intelligent technology age is going to end mass wage labor. Now, when we ended slave labor, that was both an opportunity and a threat. It was a threat to the existing economic arrangements, but it created new opportunities for a better world. But it was disruptive. As we make the shift now from mass wage labor, which is the signature of the Industrial Revolution, to small elite workforces, which is a signature for the intelligent technology revolution, it's a threat to our existing framework of organizing human activity, but it's also a great opportunity to liberate the human race from toil at the workplace. So the end of work can either be looked at as a great destabilizing period in history or a new opportunity. The, I work with CEOs all over the world. I teach at the Wharton School, our leading business school in the advanced management program. We bring in business leaders from all over the planet. The one thing they're convinced of, when I ask them, do you see mass numbers of workers in the picture in the 22nd century? No. They see more and more intelligent technology replacing both physical and intellectual labor. The cheapest worker in the world is not going to be as cheap as the intelligent technology that can replace them. The proof we saw head on in the United States last year. You know, we believe that in the 1990s we reduced our unemployment, we had a miracle because we are better at management, better at new opportunities for entrepreneurialism. Not true. What we did is we masked the unemployment in the 1990s. We went from a full-time workforce with benefits to people only marginally employed, underemployed. And then to keep it all going, we put out credit cards so everyone could buy, 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 so those who are marginally employed could still work to make, make, make the goods and services, we find it, it finally ended up where Americans were spending more than they make, called negative savings. Then to keep consumption going, all Americans who owned homes refinanced their mortgage with low interest rates so they have some money. Now we have nothing. We don't have the credit from the credit cards. We've already refinanced our homes, and the American consumers were keeping it all going. During that whole period, According to the University of Chicago study, real unemployment in the United States was 10%, similar to Europe. There was no miracle. Now, what's interesting is the United States and Brazil and Europe and all around the world say the answer is you have to have flexible labor, deregulation of industry, new incentives for the business community so we can increase productivity. Increase productivity will create new job opportunities. That's the mantra. I'm sorry to tell folks, but here's the reality. Last year in the United States, 2002, we had the greatest productivity advance in the last half century in the U.S. since 1950. 
four and a half percent rise in productivity last year. The same year, we let one million more workers go permanently. In fact, these workers are discouraged workers. They were let go, they couldn't find new jobs, so they're no longer counted as unemployed. They're simply out of the workforce. So today we have several million people who have been replaced by the technology. The increased productivity means that we can produce goods and services cheaper than having that worker produce the goods and services. But here's the contradiction in capitalism. Here's the contradiction. You reach a point where you're replacing so many workers with intelligent technology because it's cheaper and more efficient, but then you don't have workers with paychecks. They're not bringing home money. They're not buying all the new goods and services made available with the new productivity advances. They're not saving money, and they're not investing in the stock and bonds market. So what we have in the United States is we have the greatest productivity rise we've seen in a half century, increasing unemployment and underemployment. And this is a basic contradiction in the capitalist marketplace. We're going to have to resolve this by rethinking work and rethinking what people do when we don't need them at the workplace anymore. And there are things we can do. And we can talk about them if you like. Eu gostaria de levantar dois pontos nessa tese que o senhor defende, de que com o avanço tecnológico nós estaríamos fadados a uma destruição massiva de postos de trabalho. Ela é questionável, é, porque, por exemplo, ao longo do século XX, o avanço tecnológico e os ganhos de produtividade foram muito maiores do que a tecnologia existente e os ganhos de produtividade do século XIX. Todavia, nos países desenvolvidos, nós convivemos com uma situação de pleno emprego. Então, não é tão claro que o avanço tecnológico irá suprimir emprego. Depende de como você distribui a produtividade do trabalho, porque é plenamente possível trabalhar todos com jornada menor. Ao mesmo tempo, é, se nós olharmos as duas últimas décadas, nós verificaremos que os países que mais avançaram tecnologicamente são os países que têm menor taxa de desemprego. Os Estados Unidos, até 2000, antes da, da crise que, conjuntural que vem se alastrando, os Estados Unidos vinham registrando taxas de desemprego inferiores aos últimos 30 anos, e justamente o período que ele mais ampliou a sua tecnologia. E os países mais pobres, os países que menos investem em tecnologia, hoje são os países que concentram maior número de desempregados. Então, estou observando que a sua tese de que o avanço tecnológico suprime emprego, ela está sendo, de certa maneira, desfeita pelo, pela realidade atual. Well, let me respectfully disagree and very, very forcefully here. Uh, you are incorrect about the U.S. analysis. Now, for years, people said the same thing you did. They said America went down to 4% unemployment. We had a miracle. What I'm saying to you is now we're finding out with the studies that are coming out, University of Chicago is the most recent, but there are many now, that what really happened in the 1990s is people went from full-time jobs with benefits to part-time and underemployment. Secondly, Many people were left the workforce, some involuntarily. For example, many went to prison. In 1985, half a million men were in prison. Today, it's two million. So 2% of the male workforce is not counted because they're in prison, the largest incarceration rate in the world. Well, it goes on. Second, as the University of Chicago and other studies have shown, this has been published in the New York Times, millions of people simply left the workforce, their unemployment benefits ran out, they couldn't find work, and in my country, if your benefits run out and you can't find work and you give up, we don't count you as unemployed. So the real unemployment, all the people who left the workforce was 10%. You need to get that straight. That's what the statistics are now showing. We didn't have 4% unemployment. We fudged the statistics. Real unemployment was 10%, now it's near 12%. So we didn't really do any better than Europe in the 1990s. Now, the new element As here is the productivity course. increase. Now, in the last year, that productivity increase was so great, we let a million more workers go. Those are the actual statistics. You can find them in the government studies. You can find them in the pages of the New York Times. Adicionando essas informações que eu, que eu compreendo, embora a metodologia de medição do desemprego não tenha se alterado nos Estados Unidos, mesmo incorporando os números que o senhor está dizendo, as taxas de desemprego nos Estados Unidos seriam abaixo, por exemplo, da final do século XIX e início do século XX. Então, nós não estamos rumando para um desemprego excepcional, porque o desemprego é uma norma do capitalismo. 
A exceção, eu diria, foi, foram as três décadas depois do pós-guerra em que se situou uma situação de quase pleno emprego. Por quê? Porque foram feitas reformas que viabilizaram a melhor disposição da produtividade para parcelas que então puderam gerar postos de trabalho. Here's where I would say, let, let's see if we get some common ground here. I do believe that the difference here is that the new jobs that are being created are not mass labor. In the past, the first and second industrial revolution, we destroyed jobs on the way to creating new job opportunities, but they were based on mass labor. The new jobs, the high-tech jobs, they're based on small professional elite workforces, educators, consultants, technicians, computer programmers, biotech scientists. You're never going to see thousands of people coming out of the factory gates at the software companies and the biotech companies. Again, what's incontrovertible is that the cheapest worker in the world won't be as cheap as the technology replacing them. So we're going to create all sorts of new jobs, new skills, new goods and services. They're not going to require masses of physical and human labor to do them. And the business leaders I work with, forget the economists and the academics, I work with the CEOs. They don't see millions of workers in the picture in the next 20, 30, 40, or 50 years. Now, you hit on something. There are, there are things we can do. When you increase productivity, it means you can produce more with less work. So the option's always been reduce the workforce or reduce the work week so everybody can work. Now, we started the Industrial Revolution with a 70-hour work week, and we moved to a 60, a 50, and a 40, and increased the pay and benefits in commensuration with the increased productivity. Now we stopped all of a sudden. What I'm suggesting is that the new technology revolutions that in the 21st century are at least as productive as the old technology revolutions of the 19th and 20th, we should be going to a 35-hour work week, a 30-hour work week, a 25-hour work week, so more people can work with increased pay and benefits and not have to toil as much. Now, as you know, when the end of workbook came out, uh, we moved this idea, and uh, the, the, the book was instrumental in a, the French government passing a 35-hour work week. France is now the most productive country per worker in the world. So yeah, let's reduce the work week, but let's also find alternative employment. Now, here's where hydrogen comes in again. In the long run, we're going to move to elite workforces. But in the short run, there are jobs laying down a new energy infrastructure. When employment leaps happen, they happen when you change the entire energy grid, the infrastructure of a country. When we lay down steam, rail, and coal, we produced a lot of jobs. In the 20th century, when we moved to oil and the internal combustion engine electrification, we had to reconfigure the entire infrastructure. That meant short term, 50 years, lots of jobs. So here's where I will say there are jobs. When we move to the hydrogen energy infrastructure and redesign all the power grids so they're decentralized and smart and put in fuel cell and renewable technologies across the world, it's going to create in the short run a good number of jobs. In the long run, we're going to have to start rethinking what human beings do if we don't need them to work. And to my mind, it's kind of sad that the only thing we can imagine human beings doing in this world is to work to create goods and services. We so narrowly define what the worth of a human being is. Let the machines produce the goods and services. Let's free up successive generations to pay them for deep play in the civil society, to create social capital, to create communities, to broaden the experience of the human family. Let the machines produce the goods and services. And finally, I have no doubt that in the 23rd century, you're not going to see hundreds of millions of people sitting there toiling in offices and factories producing goods and services. It's all going to be done by intelligent technology. Maurício. Uh, Professor Rifkin, o senhor tem apresentado visões de um cenário muito otimista para o futuro, seja no que diz respeito à questão da energia, do emprego, da biotecnologia. Eu pergunto se não existe a possibilidade de que fatores alheios ao desenvolvimento científico e tecnológico trabalhem contra esse cenário otimista. Até que ponto o senhor não estaria confiando demais no desenvolvimento da ciência e da tecnologia de uma determinada forma e subestimando fatores sociais que agiriam contra esse cenário? Essa é uma questão. Uma segunda e na mesma linha... Let me do one question at a time. Okay. 
Oh, I'm see. smiling because if you know anything about my past history and the 16 books I've written and my activism, I have been accused for 35 years of being anti-science. I've been accused of being the Luddite in the world, the most pessimistic man in the world, correct? On science and tech. Now you're telling me I'm an optimist. I'm not an optimist. Uh, I have been critical of biotechnology. The whole opposition to genetically modified organisms started in my office. I have been critical of the internet technologies. I've been critical of the nuclear technologies. I think that technologies are an opportunity, but I agree with you, the sociology of how we apply opportunities are critical, and not every technology ought to be done. I've, always, I've been opposed to nuclear power from the get-go. It's power, but it's inordinate, it's out of scale, and we shouldn't be using it. For the same reason I oppose the release of genetically modified organisms into agriculture. There may be some benefit, but the consequences to the environment, health, and future generations outweigh that. Having said that, I think that what we need is a new story for the human family. We have to be willing to believe that we can improve our way of life. We have to be willing to believe that we have the, the, the choice to construct our future. But we have to also be wise enough to realize that it's going to come with a lot of questions and a lot of problems. I am not Pollyannish, and I'm not a wild optimist. I am of the belief that we have to go very carefully, but we also have to believe that there's a better way to do things than the way we're doing them now. I have no doubt that we're going to a hydrogen future, but I have many doubts on who's going to control it. I'll give you an example. This is the first potentially decentralized energy regime in history because you and I can make our own power. We don't need the big power companies. On the other hand, if the internet's an example, we're gonna to have to wrestle with who controls this. You know, remember in the internet, in the early years, the pioneers on the internet said information's gonna run free. Everyone's gonna share information because the internet is just all computers connected to all other computers. Therefore, we can end all this big corporate uh, power over our life, remember? Well, then Microsoft came along and said, we love the internet, but we'd like you to use our window. And then AOL came along and said, we love the internet, but we'd like you to pay an access fee to cyberspace. Now, the struggle on who controlled this great communication revolution, the big corporations or the people, that struggle's not over. It wasn't won by the big corporations, and it hasn't been won by the people. Microsoft may look strong. But watch Linux. You know Linux, open source, free code? It's growing much faster than Microsoft, and it's, and it's threatening their position of power, and it's all free. And it's being integrated into businesses across the world. The big content companies like Disney, they want to control copyright. And they're putting in all these encryption technologies and all this legislation to control copyright. But every kid in Brazil that has access to a computer, what are they doing after school? They're downloading music. They're file sharing CDs. They're getting it all free because these kids are finding a way around all of the technology. Now, if you were going to bet on companies trying to control copyright versus millions of kids around the world who have nothing better to do after school than find a way to get around the copyright, I'll bet on the kids. When we get to hydrogen, it's an even deeper question of power. Will the technology be controlled by the British Petroleums and the Dutch Shells and the Exxons? Will the big power and utility companies want to control the power grids? Will the Hewlett Packards and Microsofts want to control the communications to move the power? Or will the power be controlled by the people who generate it? I think that's going to be a big issue and nowhere is it going to be more important than in the third world. Because the real beneficiaries of this technology revolution are the developing countries. Remember, the reason all those countries are in debt has to do deeply with oil. You have this summit every year, the Porto Alegre summit. You get NGOs from all over the world coming here, right, at Porto Alegre. And they say, cancel third world debt. Amen. But if we don't understand the oil connection, we're right back into the debt. For 30 years, developing countries have been borrowing money from the World Bank and IMF to pay for the high price of oil. Ever since OPEC put on the oil embargo, third world countries have not been able to pay for oil. So now we got 90 countries worse off than 10 years ago, deeply in debt. The hydrogen revolution is an opportunity for the developing world to create a new model. And if Mr. De Silva is listening to this, watching this TV show, he is being looked at by the world as the new model. He's taken over one of the most powerful developing economies in the world, and everyone's looking to him for a new vision 
to bring the poor up so that they count. Well, let me, if I may respectfully say to Mr. DeSilva, if he's watching this show, the reason people are powerless is literal. They have no power. They have no electricity. If you're looking for firewood or dung for four or five hours a day to heat your rice, you're not part of an economic revolution. 65% of the human race has never made a phone call, and a third of the human race has no electricity. So here's where I am enthusiastic. If we can bring the cost of renewable technologies down, which I think we can, and we can begin to bring fuel cell technology into practice, every third world country can get these renewable technologies with microcredit into their villages, into their cities. Then they can generate electricity locally. Then they can produce locally and sell globally. Then we have stage two, re-globalization from the bottom up. I agree with Mr. De Silva and many of the leaders today who say globalization from the top down was not a success. It was too narrow. It was too elite. The only exchanges going on were between the wealthy. The poor were not engaged because they had no power, literally. If we can get fuel cell technology cheap enough so everyone can generate their own electricity and produce goods and services locally and sell globally, then we have deep re-globalization. We have power to the people, like we said in the 1960s. And I think the De Silva's in the world, the new leaders, who really want to make sure that everyone has access to economic well-being, this is the vision, this is the roadmap, this is the story for the next generation. And that is universal access to electricity so that we can have deep re-globalization and so everyone can participate in the economic life of the world and not just a small elite in the United States and a handful of corporations. Mas até que ponto, só continuando com Does this make sense? A... Sim, sim, faz sentido, está claro, mas uh, na, sua, na sua arguição, muitas vezes, pelo menos se passa muito a ideia de um processo racional do desenvolvimento histórico que normalmente tende à descentralização de diversos procedimentos. O senhor não concorda? Não, não, não. não. Uh -huh. Most of history has tended towards centralization, unfortunately. If you start with the great civilizations in Sumeria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt, they centralize human energy. And then if you move up toward uh, very advanced industrial civilizations, centralizing human energy and fossil fuel energy. What I'm saying now is that we have the possibility of a break in history. We're moving potentially to decentralized communication and decentralized energy where we can generate our own information and move it around the world, each of us, and we can generate our own energy and power and move around the world, each of us, and bring them together. Now, there's a long road between the theory and the practice. And in the middle are many institutional players who would love to keep that control. Just like Microsoft and AOL wanted to keep control over the decentralized World Wide Web, they're not winning, but they're not losing. There's going to be the big energy companies and utility companies are going to want to control decentralized power with hydrogen. What I'm saying is we need an Aristotelian balance. There's room for everyone here. There's room for Dutch Shell and British Petroleum to use their R&D deep pockets to help develop renewable technologies. There's room for the Hewlett Packards in the world to help redesign the power grid so they're smart and decentralized so we can move energy like we move information. There's room for the power and energy companies, utility companies, to run these very decentralized, sophisticated power grids. All that's fine, as long as we ensure that the end user, you and I, who, can, who have the fuel cells, we control our own energy. We make the deals with the power companies, utility companies, through our producer co-ops, through our municipal governments, <coughs> through our neighborhood associations, through our political parties, through our governments. There needs to be an awareness that power to the people means that when I have a fuel cell, I generate my electricity, that means I can control where it goes and I can enter into business partnerships with everyone else. So he's Is that, and that's tough. I'm 58 years old. I went through the 60s and 70s and 80s revolution and I am not sanguine here. I know that the corporations have long staying power. My question is, will the next three generations of people have as much staying power to ensure that when we get to decentralized energy, we organize like the labor unions organized in the 20th century to control our own power. The labor unions had to organize the individual energy of each worker collectively 
to negotiate with capitalist management. They couldn't do it alone. And it took the sacrifice of seven generations of people to make the labor movement strong enough to prevail. Will the next five generations of people on this planet have the same staying power to organize decentralized distributive hydrogen energy so that we have bottom-up power? It's an open question. Eu queria fazer uma pergunta. É, ao longo de todo o seu livro, o senhor menciona como uma realidade na natureza, segundo a lei da termodinâmica, é, que impõe certas restrições aos processos geradores de energia. E uma das suas teses é que todos os sistemas econômicos fracassaram e, e são um fracasso por não terem sabido lidar com essa segunda lei. Por outro lado, o senhor veio de um país, Estados Unidos, que são responsáveis hoje por cerca de um quarto das emissões de gases de efeito estufa do mundo, são os maiores geradores de entropia desse planeta. E nesse momento você está num país que tem a maior reserva florestal do mundo, onde 90% da geração de energia é feita com base em recursos hídricos e, portanto, renováveis, e que teria, de certa forma, condições de se adaptar melhor a essa nova, esse no, essa nova realidade. Eu queria que o senhor explicasse por que a economia baseada no hidrogênio ela é melhor para lidar com essa realidade natural. Em que medida o Brasil pode ser um exemplo para o mundo nesse ponto? I think Brazil, I think Brazil is the perfect bridge to the next century. You have 92% of your electricity is already hydroelectric, renewable. You need hydrogen to store that energy, so you don't have breakdowns of electricity like you had in 2001. You have the natural resources for solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, and you have a young government in power and a young society, population-wise, that can move us into this new era and be an example for the hemisphere. I hope Brazil will lead. One of the reasons I'm here in Brazil this week is to talk to Petrobras, to talk to government ministers, to talk to people across the wide swath of Brazilian experience, because I think Brazil, like Europe, together could be the new model for the 21st century for building a renewable based hydrogen society where the power is really with the people it would be a great revolution in history e a resistência do seu país onde a indústria petrolífera hoje está no poder e comanda os destinos do planeta true true but you know what if i thought that way we would never have began the campaign against monsanto When I started the campaign to oppose genetically modified organisms from Monsanto, guess how many people we had in that campaign? Three. Three farmers, two of whom have passed away since in farm accidents, and myself. I didn't start by saying the agricultural industry in Monsanto are so powerful we can't win. I started by saying their idea for genetically modified food is not a good idea. Now, that was 20 years ago we started that campaign. Now that campaign against GMOs is worldwide. Brazil, Europe, Japan. I didn't start with the idea that we can't win. I started with the idea of what do we want for the future, how do we work toward it. So I believe the U.S. is not monolithic either. We have a lot of industry and we have a lot of communities that are interested in moving out of oil into a more sustainable, renewable society. Yes, we have a government that's wedded to oil. Yes, I agree. But we also have a lot of Americans who would like to do the right thing. So here's what I've been doing. Put the pressure on. I just came back from a nine-city tour of Canada, hoping Canada can begin to be a model to put the pressure on for a renewable hydrogen economy. I was just in Mexico with Pemex and the Mexican government to have Mexico put the pressure on the U.S. In Europe, we developed a game plan for Europe to move to a renewable hydrogen society. And now I'm in Brazil. Brazil is the model that all of the developing world is looking to. And this government, right here in place today, everyone's hoping that this government will create a new economic plan, a new political idea, a new story for the human race. The best place to start, you got it. And that is you're already halfway there. Let this De Silva government and the people who have backed it across this country become the first country in this hemisphere to move out of fossil fuels, which are centralized, elite, and only favor the few and move into a decentralized, renewable-based hydrogen future for Brazil. And I believe as Brazil goes, it will be a model for all of the developing world. And it will put Brazil in a place of, of what I would call visionary leadership for the 21st century. It's a big challenge. You have a young country 
I think if this country, if any country is up to the task, this is the country to do it. É, Mr. Rifkin, esse governo novo que o senhor mencionou e que realmente carrega muitas esperanças vive hoje um paradoxo. Ele acaba de autorizar a comercialização da safra de soja transgênica que havia sido plantada ilegalmente e que, na verdade, é debaixo da, dos olhos das autoridades do governo anterior. É, e, ao mesmo tempo, o governo disse que a próxima safra não poderá ser plantada. Ou seja, temos uma situação que nós não sabemos... Em primeiro lugar, como separar a soja transgênica daquela que não é transgênica, e não está claro isso. Em segundo lugar, que país é esse? Quer dizer, que posição o Brasil tem em relação a esses uh, organismos geneticamente modificados na agricultura? Queria que o senhor explicasse por que, que o senhor é contra. Well, let me say that I think that genetically modified organisms are the wrong way to go for agriculture. We need to tone down the rhetoric and really look at it scientifically, and when you do, it doesn't really look favorable. There are environmental issues that are irresolvable in any time frame that we have seen scientifically. There are uh, problems uh, with gene flow. Genes from genetically modified organisms contaminating wild relatives or other crops that are non-GMO. So, for example, how do you have an organic agricultural industry when your organic uh, food crops are contaminated by GM and therefore you can't take them to market? How can you sell conventional soy to Europe when you find it becomes contaminated and Europe won't accept it? Uh, what happens when a gene for herbicide tolerance or pest resistance or viral resistance jumps during pollination to wild weeds? And we're already seeing that happen. And then you have wild weeds in a country that are herbicide tolerant and pest resistant and viral resistant and you can't get rid of them. Uh, what happens about the health impacts? There are so many negatives that one begins to ask, what's the, what's the value that could over-exceed them? And I don't see it. Now, Europe has a de facto moratorium on. Japan has a de facto moratorium on. Again, Brazil is the bridge player here. And here's why. Brazil's the second largest producer of soy in the entire world. So the decisions Brazil makes on soy are going to be critical to the future of agriculture. If the Brazilian government were to say, we want to go with genetically modified soy, and I think that's a bad decision, um, then it will put them in line with the United States and Monsanto, et cetera, but you will lose the European market. You will lose Japan, and you may lose much of the rest of the world, but you'll certainly lose your biggest markets. If, however, Brazil was to say, we're going to stay non-GMO free, no genetically modified soy, we're not going to do it, Brazil's in a position to garner the global market for soy because the European community, which is going to be 450 million people next May, nobody wants genetically modified food there. Even if Brussels were to accept the food, the public doesn't want it. I spend each month in Europe, and I can tell you that across Europe, nobody's going to eat genetically modified soy. So if Brazil were to move toward an aggressive policy of farming genetically engineered soy, I think your farmers are going to end up on the short end of the stick. You, sure, you'll put, be in line with American trade policy, but I think it's a losing proposition. I believe there should be an indefinite, long-term, worldwide moratorium on the release of genetically modified food crops for this reason. We don't have a predictive ecology in place. We don't have a risk assessment science that can actually tell us how dangerous these introductions might be. It's too complicated. Now, I work with the reinsurance industry all over the world. They're not insuring, and this is what everyone in Brazil ought to know, they're not insuring genetically modified organisms against long-term catastrophic environmental loss. They're only insuring for negligence and short-term crop damage. So if you have genetically modified traits pollinating into wild relatives here, weeds in Brazil, or contaminating conventional organic and other crops, who's going to be liable? The insurance industry won't pay. So does that mean that the Brazilian farmer is going to have to be liable, or the Brazilian consumer, or will the Brazilian government have to pass legislation so that the tax money is used to pay for all the environmental, health, and economic costs? So my advice to the Brazilian government, if I could give some advice, the best economic decision the Brazilian government can make for the future of Brazilian agriculture and especially soy is an uncompromising position 
of a moratorium on any use of genetically modified soy. If Brazil does that, it will garner the worldwide soy market and it will pressure, I believe, the U.S. and we'll see the end of genetically modified foods because U.S. farmers cannot maintain themselves in a market when the soy from Brazil is being sold because it's conventional and pure and our soy is not. Mr. Rifkin, the Brazil começa a ser reconhecido como talvez a grande potência agrícola mundial emergente. E no seu livro, Economia do Hidrogênio, fica-se com a sensação de que a agricultura é um setor que se exclui um pouco da economia do hidrogênio na medida em que ela depende, a produtividade agrícola depende ainda fortemente de, é, dependente, de derivados do petróleo. Nesse sentido, eu gostaria que o senhor analisasse o impacto da economia da hidro, do hidrogênio no, no agronegócio né, e as consequências disso para a economia brasileira, na medida em que a eficiência agrícola do Brasil é um dos poucos trunfos que o país tem para é, competir nesse complicado jogo do comércio internacional. This is very important what you've raised. You know, most people, when they think about oil prices going up, they worry they won't have enough gasoline for their car. That's the main worry. They don't think about electricity. They don't realize that oil and natural gas and coal prices all affect electricity because that's how we generate electricity. Most people think, oh my God, high price of gas, I won't have enough for my automobile. What they don't realize is the, the most important economic arena that, that's affected by oil is agriculture. In my country, and I point this out in my book, in my book, The Hydrogen Economy, I have a section in the hydrogen economy on agriculture. And in my country, 17% of all the oil used in my country is used to process and grow food and agriculture. 17% of the entire energy budget in my country is to grow food using petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides, to process food using fossil fuels, to transport and market food. And I'm sure it's just as high here. Now imagine the consequences. Uh, as we move toward peak in oil production, and, and geologists are saying that global peak could happen as early as the end of this decade, probably no later than 2035 if you believe the OECD, it means oil prices are going to continue to go up. The biggest effect will be in agriculture because agriculture uses so much oil to produce and process and market food. So it's essential that a country like Brazil, which is a leader in agriculture, be a leader in the new energy regime. And that is to use renewable resources here in Brazil to wean Brazil off of oil. Now, the good news about Brazil is you're already ahead of the game for electricity because 90% of your electricity is already generated with renewable hydroelectric power. Now, the problem there is you don't yet have hydrogen to store that power. So you have droughts like two years ago and your electricity goes off. So to begin with, you're going to want to take hydrogen out of water. You're going to want to generate your electricity with hydroelectric. Part of the electricity will be used to then grab hydrogen from the water so you have stored energy. Now, you're still a big user of oil. You're one of the largest users of oil in the world. If you want agricultural prices to be competitive on the world market, you've got to move toward renewable energy locally generated, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, use that energy to generate electricity, part of the electricity used to then grab hydrogen out of water so you have stored energy to run your tractors, to, uh, to uh, run your machinery, to transport to market, to process your foods. So I think it's essential that uh, Brazil, if it wants to be a great agricultural leader, move out of fossil fuel dependency into a renewable-based hydrogen economy because you can't process modern agriculture with a lot of, without a lot of use of energy. Now, there are some things that hydrogen can't do. They can't substitute for petrochemical fertilizers. They can't substitute for pesticides at this point. But organic agriculture could. Mas não será simples e nem econômica esta migração para fontes renováveis no caso da agricultura. Não lhe parece? The, it'll be what? Não, lhe, não, não será é, simples e nem não, é, não. barata esta migração. O que eu tenho dito para os líderes 
and to CEOs and NGOs, this is going to be a very challenging, disruptive revolution. You have to think of the enormity of this challenge on scale with the introduction of steam, coal, and rail. The disruption of that technology revolution was af affected the entire politics and sociology of the world for a century. You have to think of this fuel cell and hydrogen revolution as disruptive and challenging as when we brought together oil, the internal combustion engine, and electrification. It changed everything. It was disruptive for the entire 20th century, but we had some benefits. What I'm saying here is we need to be on the roadmap to a renewable hydrogen future. We have to understand this is not going to happen overnight. There are technological hurdles. There, there are many institutions who don't want to see this happen. There's a lot of questions about transfer of power. Imagine power, which is generated from the top down in the fossil fuel era, so a few hundred companies run the world, to power that can be generated from the bottom up in each community where you could have re-globalization where power really was to the people. I've heard 30 years of slogans. I came out of the 1960s. I kept hearing the slogan, power to the people, power to the people. And now I'm saying to the world, let's get real. You got to move it from slogan to reality. Power to the people starts with actually having power, energy, electricity. So if the De Silva government is interested in a economic revolution that can bring the poor of the world into the 21st century, they ought to begin by creating a renewable roadmap to get to a hydrogen future so that every human being in this country can generate their own power and be a player. If they do anything short of that, it's, a, it's rhetoric, but it will not change the basic configuration of the system. And the system now is top-down and fossil fuel. And unless you get off fossil fuels, you will not get off that elite political infrastructure that runs the world. Does that make some sense? Faz, faz sentido. Isso aí, Fiquem. Eu estou ouvindo o senhor falar há algum tempo já e fiquei me perguntando agora é, o que, que move o senhor é, nessa pregação por tantos assuntos diferentes, esses que o senhor, que o senhor mencionou. E, e aí eu, me ocorreu fazer uma pergunta, não, não quero, não, absolutamente ela não é grosseira, é, mas eu queria saber, o senhor ficou rico com a sua pregação? After all these years, I'll, I'll tell you actually where I stand, although it's a personal question. I spent uh, 30 years of my life, all, everything that I did, mm -hmm. all the income that I enjoyed, yes, all of it went to organizing activity. Mm -hmm. And then my wife and I woke up to the reality a few years ago that I'm turning 60 <laughs> and we had not one penny for retirement. So I'm trying to raise some money for our retirement. We don't live like millionaires. Mm -hmm. We're middle class. Mm -hmm. Uh, I understand that I've been blessed. I've worked very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the income I've generated through my whole life has gone back into organizing activity. But also, I don't believe that anyone should live in the poorhouse. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the, the amenities of a middle class existence. And I believe everyone else on this planet ought to be able to enjoy those amenities. Uh, as my mother used to say, uh, uh, having wealth doesn't buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. But she should have added, being very poor doesn't bring you happiness either. Mm -hmm. We need that Aristotelian balance. So I try to live it myself, and I, I hope that we can begin a soul-searching discussion around the world so that we can all enjoy a better life for our children. Quer dizer, o, o, o senhor, eu suponho que os seus livros devam ser best-sellers, devem vender bastante bem. E deve ser, isso, possivelmente, eu imagino que seja uma fonte dos seus the sales records. Depends on the book and it depends on the country. <laughs> Look, I've had books that no one's ever heard of. They uh -huh. got published, they disappeared. Uh -huh. uh, people tend to hear about the ones that do well. But for, for my purposes, you know, you reach a period in life around 40 and then around 50. Mm -hmm. I'm heading to 60. Mm -hmm. You know, the first part of our life, we ask, what can we do to get ahead, use our skills? And around midlife, we all began to ask, there's got to be something more here. What can we leave behind? And so, to my mind, I think as we turn that middle age and, and beyond, we start asking what's important. In my own life, in the last many years, the last 15 or 20, I've asked what are the handful of important things that I'd like to leave behind. The biotech revolution, I was very critical of many aspects of it. I think it could be a renaissance, but I'm very, very worried about it becoming a commercial eugenics brave new world. So I spent 20, 25 years of my midlife critical of it. Mm -hmm. On the hydrogen revolution, I have been 
worried for a long time that if we stay in fossil fuels, it's going to see the collapse of this civilization. We're going to fight for the existing fossil fuels. We're going to have more young people in harm's way. So I've tried to dedicate some time over the last 25 years to can we get off nuclear power? Mm -hmm. Can we get off fossil fuels and all of that elitism that goes with it and into renewables and hydrogen? So there have been some areas in life where I think it's important to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. When push comes to shove, none of these changes happen unless there's a change in the will of people around the world. Now, Brazil interests me. Mm -hmm. This is a very young country. I smell it when I'm here. The average population is very young compared to Europe and my country. Mm -hmm. There's a vigor here. There's a vitality here. There's an energy here. It's not focused. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain set of principles in place. And that is, we want to bring everyone into the future. We want to make sure that we have a community here in Brazil that respects diversity, sustainability, mm -hmm. and gives everyone an opportunity to make something of their life in a peaceful world. That's the new order. That's the new story. You got a new head of state. Everyone's putting so much attention to him, but he can't do it alone. What we need is the Brazilian community. That means the academic community, the professional community, the business community, the unions, the working people, the farmers, together to jointly create a roadmap for the future. I would love to see a roadmap for Brazil that brings us into a renewable hydrogen decentralized democratic future as a model for the world. And I'd love to see a Brazil that leads in agriculture, that takes us off the insanity of chemical-based farming and genetic engineering farming, which does so much damage to the environment and so much damage to future generations. I'd like to see Brazil lead us out of that into using the new biology, the new science, to create organic, sustainable food mm -hmm. so that we have better options for the next generation. So in these two regards, a new energy regime, new approaches in agriculture, mm -hmm. this country here in our hemisphere, Brazil, it's in a position to do something that can be a model for the rest of us. Pode fazer uma em relação aos seus estudos que estão um pouco na fronteira da investigação técnica e cenários visionários. O senhor se coloca mais como o Júlio Verne da literatura ou o Alfred Chandler da história da ciência? Do you think, do, 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 are you saying I'm more like Jules Verne or more like what? A Luddite? Or Fred Chandler. Well, let, it's interesting because I had, uh, I'm not a big uh, fan of science fiction, but I have a little story about Jules Verne in my book, The Hydrogen Economy. He wrote a little teeny book, Jules Verne, a, a hundred years ago, called A Mysterious Island. And mm -hmm. a handful of soldiers went up in a hot air balloon to escape. And they ended up in this little island. And they're talking one night in the book. And one of the, one of the uh, soldiers says to the engineer who was with them, what if we run out of coal? Isn't that the end of the Industrial Revolution? And the engineer in this little story that Jules Verne wrote said, ah, no, I believe in the future. Hydrogen will be the power source for civilization. We'll extract it from water. I don't know how he got it, <laughs> but he got it. Uh, I think that technology is not neutral. This idea that technology is value-free is ridiculous. Technology is power. A bow and arrow gives you more power than your arm. An automobile gives you more power than your legs. Computers amplify memory. The issue here is how much power is appropriate and in whose hands does it lodge. So what we need is an informed debate in every society on which kinds of new technologies ought to be introduced and is the power appropriate and can it be controlled on behalf of the people in a responsible way for future generations. We need to take that responsibility. Up to now, we've allowed the big corporate institutions and the scientific institutions to pretty well have their own way without public input. Now we need everybody. We need the scientists, we need the engineers, we need the corporate entrepreneurs, but we better damn well have the public engaged in these debates because it's our future and our children's options that are at stake. Mr. Rifkin, é, o nosso tempo está acabando, eu vou fazer uma última pergunta, que é a seguinte, normalmente é, as análises e interpretações é, similares a que o senhor é, apresenta vêm acompanhadas de um outro dado que não foi apresentado aqui e que contradiz, num certo sentido, muitas das previsões da ficção científica, que é a questão de se mudar o modelo de sociedade de consumo em que nós vivemos. 
Né? Quer dizer, é, em primeiro lugar, nós temos hoje no mundo, eu não sei se existe na história da humanidade, uma situação em que haja pessoas tão ricas, tão absurdamente ricas no planeta, é, em relação a uma grande massa que ganha muito pouco ou quase nada. E em segundo lugar, nós temos na classe média um consumo absurdo de produtos. O senhor acha que é necessário haver essa mudança no modelo de consumo, digamos, da sociedade? Never before in history have we had this kind of divide between the haves and have nots. And uh, where a handful of human beings in the world have so much access and the rest have so little. You go back to Paleolithic history, Neolithic history, ancient antiquity, medieval Europe, we've never seen this divide. The 356 wealthiest people in the world today, you could put them in this room. Their assets now equal the annual income of 40% of humanity. The three richest men in the world, their assets now equal the annual income of the 940 million poorest people on earth. That's why we have so much instability. We have such great divide. This is not what this species should be all about. I believe that the fossil fuel era has contributed greatly to the divide. That doesn't mean there hasn't been a divide before in history. But you know, fossil fuels are only found in certain parts of the world, coal, oil, and gas. So it takes huge military and political establishments to control them. And that was the geopolitics of the 19th and 20th century. And it takes huge capital investment to move oil and gas and coal through the body politic. So we ended up in the 20th century with a top-down energy regime. A few dozen energy companies, a couple hundred corporations, moving the oil civilization. We now have an opportunity, and it's just an opportunity. We may blow it. Mm -hmm. I hope we don't. But we have an opportunity now for energy to be distributed to everyone, because hydrogen is found everywhere on the earth. True, it has to be extracted. But if we can find a way to extract hydrogen from direct sunlight and from water and make it cheap, for the first time in modern history, everyone can have access to energy and electricity and therefore be empowered. They can move from powerlessness to actually having power. It's called electricity and energy. Then we have the possibility of bottom-up reglobalization. The reason globalization didn't succeed is fairly simple. It requires trust to have globalization because you have to break down boundaries and tariffs. You have to eliminate trade barriers. You have to deregulate industries. But that means there has to be social trust between people to want to break down those borders. When most of the human race is not involved, the social trust doesn't increase, it decreases. And when I ask business leaders, do you think we're getting greater social trust each year or less? They all say less. The answer is deep reglobalization, but that won't happen with just rhetoric and principle statements and UN forms and good intentions. For reglobalization to happen, everyone has to be able to have electricity, renewable hydrogen base, so they can produce their goods and services, and then they can exchange with the world. And I'll end with this thought. It's a strange thought, but you have a big Italian population here in, in mm -hmm. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sure. Italy's a good example of the role model here. Italy is the sixth largest economy in the world. 60 million people, not bad. But their economy relies on very small and independent businesses, small and medium-sized enterprises, little family operations who then produce locally and then join in producer cooperatives, it's kind of a socialist model, to have economies of scale and sell to the world. Small, medium-sized businesses, giant confederations and cooperatives selling to the world. That's the only G7 country that's a good economic model for the developing world. If 60 million Italians could do it with little teeny companies, because they had access to electricity and energy, and therefore the world, it means every community in Brazil can do it. It means every community in America and Africa and Asia can do it. But there's a long road from saying it's possible to making it happen. And I'll leave with this thought, and this is, this is a hope. My hope is that the next three generations will have the state intuitiveness, the young people, the will and resolve to actually take control over their own destiny and control over this new power source. They have to have the same courage that generations of labor union people did when they organized collectively the great labor movements of this world in the 20th century. Without those great labor movements, capitalism would have collapsed because it was the workers of the world who demanded that the gains be shared so there's enough income generated so that we can buy the goods and services. It took six generations of working people sacrificing for the organized labor movement to make it happen. We need the next six generation of Brazilian young people to have that sense of sacrifice. 
Uh, your new government's been in just a short period of time and everyone's jubilant, but now the discipline comes. Uh, U.S. in some ways is the old model. I wish it weren't. Brazil's the new model, but you have to convince the rest of us that you have the staying power to help lead us into this new world. That's what we're hoping for. É, muito obrigado, Mr. Riffin. Eu penso às vezes que a gente, quando faz um programa como esse, em que nós discutimos coisas aparentemente distantes da realidade das pessoas, a gente está um pouco é, fugindo do que é o dia a dia. Agora, por outro lado, na hora em que eu imagino que esse programa aparece ao lado de toda a programação da rede comercial de televisão, onde exatamente essas questões jamais são abordadas, eu tenho certeza que uma TV pública como a Cultura está exatamente cumprindo a sua função ao fazer esse tipo de análise e de abordagem. Queria agradecer a sua participação aqui, a participação dos nossos entrevistadores, de você que está em casa, e convidá-lo para estar aqui novamente na próxima segunda-feira, às 10h30 da noite, com mais um Roda Viva. Uma ótima semana e até segunda.